Dr. Troy Ball. Welcome to the general grant writing workshop on how to write effective proposals. So you all have the PowerPoint. Uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to start with the presentation. Denise will give me a sign so that I don't go more than 35, 45 minutes because I want to allow plenty of time for questions. When we get to the Q&A part, we will try to alternate questions between in-person and online so that everyone has an opportunity. And as I mentioned earlier, those of you that are here in person, I will stay if any of you have any additional questions. So on the next slide, please, the workshop description. This session is really designed for foundations. There are different kinds of proposal writing, governmental, corporations. This one is really specific to foundations. It's open to all because a lot of the material that's going to be covered is from my perspective and my experience of 40 plus years of being a grant writer, both from uh, working and directing nonprofits and in my role as a grant maker at both a community foundation and now at, at Konama. So that's why it's aimed at all levels. Those of you that have a lot of experience, those of you that are new to it, a lot of the same characteristics and tips will, will still uh, apply. I want to acknowledge both Dennis and Denise part of the Konalma team that have um, contributed to this presentation. Thank you for being here also for your support. We have a great, great group here. And I want to acknowledge Deborah Walker, who is a new member of our Konalma Health Foundation Board of Trustees. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah is also formally affiliated with Konalma in a different capacity. She was a project director for a nursing diversity initiative that we did a few years ago. So we're just honored to have you. And by way of disclaimer, the information that I'm covering here is I'm not here to represent funders. I'm here to represent my 40 plus years of experience and of course to represent Konalma, but the information is not specific to Konalma. If you wanna know about funding opportunities with our foundation, the first thing you should know is that our deadline is June 15th. You can go to our website, the URLs are posted on your handout. There are two. One is a pre-proposal session that Denise did as program director. The second is a tutorial that Cecily Labor, our information manager, did on the online application process. So, you know, please um, go through through there. I'm also, uh, even though I am an experienced grant writer, in addition to writing proposals, I'm a grant reviewer. And I also used to teach grant writing at the graduate and undergraduate level. So I have a lot of experience that I'm happy to share. But I also want to add that I'm always learning. I consider myself a lifelong learner. So I also learn from, from others as, as I go along day to day. As I stated, this information is not specific to Konama. However, I will use examples from Konama just by way of you know, explanation. Context. Next slide, please. So in, in terms of where revenues for nonprofits come from, this little pyramid gives you some idea at the majority of funding for nonprofits actually comes from individual donors and fees for service. Although we know that not all nonprofits can charge fee for services. So remember, this is generalized information. It's not going to be the same for every organization. But in general, in terms of the sector, the majority of revenue comes from individual donors and fees for services. 
some nonprofits, roughly 20 to 30 percent of revenue is from governmental contracts. Again, that varies. Some nonprofits choose not to apply for governmental funding at any level, city, county, state, federal, tribal. Some don't have the capacity. There's a different type of accountability that's involved. Foundation grants generally only represent 9 to 13 percent of revenue. However, like with any of these other categories, there are advantages and disadvantages. Foundation grants may be more flexible, may be less restrictive. It really depends on the funder. Then there's other types of income. Some organizations have endowment set up, so they're able to use a little bit of that interest earning or the corporate donations or other types of, of revenue. But generally, that's the, the pyramid. In the next slide, this information is from Philanthropy Southwest, a recent giving study. And note that anything I do, I always try to give the attribution. I'm a recovering academic, so I always require that students cite where it's from so that people can, first you give credit, and secondly, you can go back and find the full report. So I try to do that with everything. If I missed anything, please let me know. So Philanthropy Southwest did this study, and this is what they found, that um, a little under 200 foundations granted more or nearly 60 5 million, representing a nearly 12% increase in dollars from the last, from the study two years prior. So this is a positive trend that there is a little bit more. Now, however, let me put that in context. There was also a study done that was called the philanthropic divide and New Mexico was in the bottom 10 states in the country in terms of the amount of uh, philanthropy that's available. And there's a lot of philanthropy in New Mexico that is from out-of-state funders like Kellogg, Robert Wood Johnson, et cetera. So relatively speaking, we're still low in terms of the amount of philanthropy that, that goes on. But this gives you, again, some, some context that um, relatively speaking is in the right direction. In terms of proposal writing, there are generally three types of categories, foundation, governmental, and corporate. They all are a little bit different. Government, I usually refer to as contract because any of you that have done uh, write, have written a proposal for governmental, you know that it's two inches thick and it's basically filling in the blanks. Corporate, all over the place, there's no standard. And foundation, there's no standard. Every funder has a different process. There are, however, some basic elements and there are uh, different processes. So for example, some funders have a one-step process where you simply submit one proposal and that's it. You're either funded or you're not. Some have a two-step where you may be requested to first submit an LOI, a letter of inquiry, and then the funder will you know, invite or not invite you to submit a full, pro a full proposal. For CONAMA, we use both. We use a one-step for our small grants. That is a small grant cycle up to 15,000. And for our Northern New Mexico health grant group, grant cycle, which is also a one step. For our multi-year proposals, those are where we award 50,000 a year for three years or 150,000 total. On that one, we do have a two-step process where we invite the LOI and then we decide who we're gonna invite to submit a full proposal. So that's one of the aspects that you wanna be, wanna be clear on. But every proposal has to answer the question, you know, who, what, when, where, why, and how much. You know, that's something, regardless of what type of proposal you are working on, you need to be able to answer those questions. Some of the elements that are pretty standard, uh, regardless of 
funder would be, you know, the introduction, your organizational information, contact information, the project, what you're applying for, what you'd be using the money for, the goals and objectives, activities, the budget, of course, to support the proposal, some type of evaluation component. More and more funders are requiring that your evaluation be outcome oriented versus just activities. So rather than just saying how many people you saw, how many sessions you did, you need to really speak to what is it you're trying to accomplish? What is the, the outcome? It's answering the so what question. And attachments. Uh, again, that varies pretty widely between funders. One um, general rule that I recommend uh, based on my experience is do not include a cover letter unless it's requested. Uh, most funders won't look at it. Um, if they want a cover letter, they'll say include a cover letter. But if they don't ask for it, do not include it. The Foundation Center is a great resource on a number of levels. One is that the Foundation Center offers a free online short course on proposal writing. And it gives you the information that you see on slide six in detailed form. So I do encourage those of you, particularly those of you where this is new, to take a look at that. And again, there is no standard. This simply gives one perspective and you can see that the basic elements of a proposal, according to the Foundation Center, include some type of executive summary. For those of you that are, have an academic background, that's similar to an abstract, where you're doing a, a short, you know, kind of half page to one page summary of the whole proposal. The statement of need, you know, why is this necessary? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that project description, nuts and bolts, how the project will be implemented and evaluated, budget, the description and budget narrative, organization information, history, governance, activities, services, target area, and this one recommends a conclusion or a summary. On the next slide, we're on number seven. These are my kind of top 10 tips. So again, this is just based on my own experience and I will go through this one by one. The first one is do your homework. We, uh, Denise and I meet with prospective applicants year round. But when people call me and say, we'd like, you know, I'd like to meet with you about what you fund, like to tell you about our program. The first thing I'll ask is, have you reviewed our guidelines? Have you looked at our health equity report and roadmap for grant making, which gives you comprehensively the types of things that we do? Have you looked at, you know, our website, the grants that we do? If they haven't, then I very politely say, after you've done that, I'd be happy to meet with you and answer you know, any other questions or see where there's a good fit. But you have to do your homework. In the spectrum of the nonprofit sector, grant makers and grant seekers are all part of the nonprofit sector at different sides, although there are hybrids in between. But there are many more people on the non-grant making side than there are on the funder side. Roughly 10% are funders. So that means that there's a lot more people looking for funding than there are people and, and resources available. So it's really important that you, you know, do your research and there's a lot of different ways to do that. But you know, do your do your homework. You need to research the funder. There are many opportunities for you to do that. The website is always the best, best place to start. Many funders have more information. In our case, 
It's called Health Equity in New Mexico, a roadmap for grant making and beyond. Plus, of course, we have the pre-proposal that many funders offer. You can look at 990s. Those are public documents. And you can see what grants were awarded. You can see what, who the board members are, the size of the grants, mission. And you can look at any supporting documents. Some funders, for example, McCune recently released their um, strategic plan. It gives you all that information in terms of what they're looking and where the connection might be. I am pleased to say that I have a very high rate of success in my grant making. There are very, very few proposals that I didn't receive. And it's not because I'm an expert writer, it's because I know the system. So grant writing and the correlation between writing a proposal and being funded has to do with all of these other elements, researching, making sure it's a good fit, and, and so forth. The second tip on slide nine, follow instructions. Now that may seem real simple, but I can give you example after example of proposals, applications we received where people did not follow instructions. So, you know, triple check, you know, make sure, do a little checklist, that's what I do, and then I just check it off, check it off, and then I check again. Follow instructions. Pay attention to any special requests, include all attachments, respond to all questions, even if you put not applicable. You know, just follow, keep calm and follow instructions. Number three, slide 10, stay within your mission. Many of you have heard the term mission drift. What that means is you're following the money. What I do, and I think one of the, the reasons I'm successful, is that I look for funding to support what we're doing versus following a new RFP, request for proposals, that has come out where there's money available. Now, it doesn't mean you can't change your scope, but it has to be thoughtful and it has to be institutionalized, meaning if your board and staff um, and stakeholders have decided to expand your mission or to change it, then that's perfectly acceptable. You simply have to state that, you know, that we are changing from rape crisis to violence prevention. And these are the reasons, and so this is why we're applying. That is perfectly acceptable. But if you're simply just, again, trying to follow the money, it's not going to work, and funders will see through that. And it actually is a disservice to your organization because you get overextended. There's just many, many reasons um, against that. You know, note that funders are interested in the needs uh, that you're serving, but there has to be a, a good fit. Next slide, this is number 11. Many of you have heard the term SMART goals. This simply means that you know when you are providing information about what you're going to be doing, they have to be specific, time measured, and something that can be achievable. So that's all the acronym SMART is standing for, is that they are specific, they're measurable, they're action-oriented, they're realistic, and they're timely, time-specific. So if you can just kind of remember that, that's why it's, it's helpful to include that in terms of your, of your writing. Number five, the, the statement of need. This one I find frequently in the nonprofit sector. We are all very passionate about what we do. But don't assume that other people are. You have to state your case. You have to present it in such a way that it's clear you know, what it is you're doing and that everyone understands 
what it is that you're doing. So you really need to, to focus on that. So for example, if you submit a proposal uh, for services to serve homeless, well, don't assume everyone shares your position that there is a need to support the homeless. So some examples of what you can do is you can talk about the correlation between homelessness, mental illness, homelessness, returning veterans. You see what I'm getting at is that, you know, just state your case in a way that people can understand kind of where you're coming from. Also, keep in mind on the statement of need that it is not funders' responsibility to keep nonprofit organizations alive. Funders' job is to connect resources with community needs and issues. It's done largely through grants to nonprofits, but the purpose is not necessarily for your organization. The purpose is to serve the respective community. So sometimes we'll get proposals that will say, if we don't get this money, we're going to have to close. Well, that's not our problem, frankly. And let me qualify that by saying I'm a very strong nonprofit advocate, very strong. I've worked with the nonprofit sector all my life. But when someone tells me that, I will say, not my problem. The only way it's my problem is if it's part of a safety net where not having certain organizations is going to impact the community. So you are responsible, respectively, in terms of you know, managing your organization, but do not frame it that way that you know, if you don't fund us, we're going to close. Um, when the economic uh, situation turned in 2008, we got lots and lots of calls about people that were in that position. And it, it's, um, I frankly think it's going to get worse now before it gets better. But you have to keep in mind that funders also have their own responsibilities. They are bound by their mission, by their board, by other constituencies. So make sure that when you're writing the proposal and you're developing a statement of need, that you're really speaking to those that you're serving. Then this is one of my pet peeves, number 13, the circular reasoning, circular thinking. And we often do get this um, a lot. This is where your solution is the same as the problem. So for example, the problem is there is no health clinic. Therefore, the solution is we want to set up a health clinic. Now, that is circular reasoning. So in that particular case, the need or the problem is not the lack of the health clinic. It is accessibility, availability and accessibility to healthcare services. That's the issue. The solutions could be many. It could be a health clinic, it could be visiting nurse services or home services, it could be transportation to services, or it could be focused on prevention and developing a healthy community. So that's the difference between circular thinking versus having a clear case statement in terms of the need issue and then proposing your solution and justifying why you're picking that particular uh, perspective. This is the heart of a proposal. And this is where applications get declined be because of this type of circular thinking. Number seven, using data. Data is, is good. And if you go to our website and many others, a lot of people have reports, statistics that can support the work that you're doing. Using national data is helpful in terms of framing a particular issue or need, but you also need to support it with local data. That's very important. 
So for example, uh, the issue of grandparents raising grandchildren, that is a national epidemic. In New Mexico, roughly 50% of grandparents are raising grandchildren. Where, right, where I live in Rio Riba, Española, it's 60%. So I would use all of that information. I would give the national and then I would give, you know, the, the local. So there, there's a lot of data available. There's the census information, there uh, information that Kids Count puts out. Um, again, on Konama's website, under resources, we have a whole variety of reports that we have done or, or commissioned, as well as other reports that may be of interest. So, you know, look at your data and keep it updated. Budgets. Check your math. There are a lot of mistakes that we see just in terms of the, the basic math. Sometimes it's because you went and changed something and then you forgot, you know, in your program part, and then you forgot to go back and make the adjustments. So, you know, check, verify, check again. Also, you need to match your budget with the program request. If your proposal is heavy in terms of outreach to rural areas, then you know that there are going to be some direct costs directly correlated like travel, you know, transportation. So make sure on your program side that you're matching it or that you're showing how it's going to be served. Some of that may be in kind where your organization is doing it, but you have to make sure that the amount is adequate to what you're doing, that you don't have too little money because then that speaks to your capacity and you won't really be able to, to do it. And of course, stay within funders guidelines. We have had occasion where the maximum was 15 or 20,000 and we get a request for 60,000. That's usually automatically declined. So, you know, pay attention to the, the funder limits. Another tip is don't ask for 100% of project support unless you can justify it. And I will give you a couple of examples. Say you're a very small organization and maybe your budget is only 35,000. And so you're asking for five or 10,000 one-time expense to develop a particular project. It could be a toolkit, it could be setting up uh, information referral, but it's a one-time expense and you clearly don't have the, the funds to do that. So something of that nature, a funder, and, and Konama in fact has funded those type of activities at 100%. But a calculation that I've always done as a grant maker is I calculate the percent of the request to the project. So if the project cost, for example, is 30,000 and you're asking for 15,000, that's reasonable because it's 50-50. You're sharing part of it, even if some of yours is in kind and you're asking for 50%. If, however, your budget is 1 million and you're asking for 100% of a project, that the project is 15,000 and you're asking for 15,000, then you really have to justify that. Uh, that's a real important you know, consideration for you. So to give you an example, Konama has an initiative called Healthy, pa Healthy People, Healthy Places. It's a three-year initiative. We received one-third of the funding from national funders we brought a coalition of New Mexico funders together. They put in one third, and then Konama on its own put in one third. We were funded. Uh, you know, that's an example of where everyone is contributing, we're leveraging resources. So pay attention to that calculation. And if you are asking for 100%, really make sure that you justify it. The other tip I want to give in terms of budget is round up or round down and don't use cents. If our maximum is 15000 and someone asks us for $14,894.15, well, we're not going to fund that. 
in that amount, right? We might either fund 14,000, we will not fund more than is requested. So in that case, I would have just rounded up to 15,000. You know, uh, we have a certain amount, all funders have a certain amount. They rarely are gonna fund odd numbers because for a variety of reasons. So, you know, please round up, round down, um, use whole numbers and do not use cents. Well, use cents, the other cents, <laughs> the other one. All righty, number 15. This is a fun one, you know, avoid proposalese. That's the, the term I use for all the jargon that people use. All of our professions have jargon. We don't always know it. I'm very guilty of that. We have a wonderful communications consultant that has helped us translate some of our language like health equity to a term that people understand that really is providing effort so that everyone has a right to, to good health. So make sure if you use a term or an acronym that you always explain it and always explain it, you know, you define it and you explain it in terms of the context of how you're using it. Assume that the reviewers are lay people and don't know anything about your organization, don't know anything about your work. It, at Konama, our grant review committee is comprised of 12 people. Six are members of our board of trustees, six are members of our community advisory committee, in addition to myself. Everyone has a different background. These people are from around the state. So, you know, it could be attorneys, social workers, nurses, doctors, advocates, health counsel. They're all types of, of backgrounds. So don't assume because we're a health foundation that the reviewers will really understand your field. So you need to not dumb it down. I mean, that's not what I'm suggesting, but you need to be clear and you need to explain, you need to define terms and, and concepts. It's very, very important. Make every word count. What I have seen as a trend in terms of the grant writing is that even as, as not so far back as five and 10 years, proposals were more open-ended. So, you know, you could explain, you could describe your organization, your project. Oftentimes there weren't word limits and there might be for the total proposal like 10 pages, but not necessarily by section. It would say, describe your organization, what you're trying to accomplish, how much money you need. They were more open-ended. And what, I would, what we would see is that people would spend a whole lot of time on describing your organization and very little in terms of what you were asking for and how you were gonna measure your um, uh, achievements. Now what you'll find is that most applications are online. It's answer the question and their, their space limited. Some won't allow you to put more words and so you have to go back and edit. Some there's a little bit of leeway, but it's a very different process than it was 10 years ago. And so you have to be very concise with your wording and you have to be very clear. When I taught college and people had to do a thesis, which may be 50 to 100 pages, we would go backward. They would do that piece, then I'd have them do a five page summary, then I'd have them, you know, synthesize it into a one page abstract. They hated it, but it was a very good learning experience and very effective as a grant writer is to, thank you, is to learn to be concise and to be clear. And you can do it. The more uh, practice you have it that you're going to see that that skill helps you in other parts of your of your work and your life. And then I always start and end with integrity. You know, integrity is, you know, where you're honest and truthful 
and you kind of, you know, walk your talk, right? That's what integrity means to me, that you're consistent. So the relationship between grant makers and grant seekers should be a partnership. It's not a hierarchy. It should be a partnership. We as grant makers, this is what we do. We have to give out a certain amount of money. For private foundations, that's 5%. So we're not doing this out of the goodness of our hearts. It's the purpose of why foundations are established is charitable giving. So with the work that you're doing, your job is to provide services as the, as the grant seekers. So it really is a partnership. You want to work with funders. You want to you know, be clear in terms of where there's an intersection between what your needs are, what the resources, what the funders are looking at. And you want to develop that relationship on an ongoing basis. So during the year, before a deadline, that's when you contact funders and say, I'd like to talk with you. I've reviewed all your materials. Um, I'd like to talk with you about where maybe there is, a, is an intersection. You know, that's the time to do it. Now, some funders won't meet with you. The majority will, Konama will, um, but it doesn't hurt you to ask. You're not asking for money for yourself. You're asking for support in terms of the work that you're doing. So it's important um, to develop that relationship I am of the school that you do not pad your budget. You know, uh, not all of my colleagues agree with me. I have never padded a budget. You know, I ask for what I think is needed and I justify it. I usually get it, not always, but that's just my opinion and my experience. Don't promise what you can't deliver. You need to, you know, make it manageable. Again, going back to the SMART goals, make it manageable, achievable, have the budget to support that. And if your situation changes, stay in contact with the foundation's program officer or program director. We completely understand that. Sometimes you apply for something, something may have changed in the environment. It's perfectly fine to say, you know, we don't really need that anymore, but what we can do, still related to your overall mission, is do this and the program officer or the program director will work with you in terms of a, of a change of scope. We, most funders also don't want their money back. If you got a 15,000 or 50,000 and you have not used it all because one of the activities had to be delayed that's outside of the grant period, simply contact the program officer, the program director and ask for an extension. Funders don't want their money back. They want it to go for, for the purpose. Follow through if funded. You know, make sure you turn in your reports. If you, you know, have an opportunity again to meet with the funder and talk about, you know, what you're doing, that's always a, always a, a good thing. If you have publicity, that's always, you know, good to know. But keep that relationship uh, going. That's very important. And if there are any changes, make sure you let folks know. One of the changes I made when I came to Konama is change the way that we do, that we award grants. What we found, for example, is if we gave the full amount at the start of the year, 20000 or whatever that amount may be, we gave the whole check at the beginning. And then we would ask for the report when we sent out the reminder, we'd invariably get these messages. Well, what were what was it for? And, you know, I'm new, the person left, and what were we supposed to be doing? And we're like, uh, okay. So what we did is we changed it to a six month where we give half of the check of or the award at the start. Then we ask for a six month interim report. Uh, Denise will review that. I'm an exception manager, so what that means is if the grantee did what they needed to do, then I don't need to know any more about that. If they didn't perform, I want to know. Or if they exceeded, I want to know. So once that was done, thank you. Once that was done, then we would release the other half or we would make adjustments. 
And what we found is that that helped us in terms of being good stewards of our resources, but it also helped the nonprofit because that was an opportunity to say, well, you know, we've done this, but we'd like some adjustments for the other part. So it really helped um, everyone. In terms of your proposal writing, you want to look at what level of change are you focusing on? Are you looking at neighborhoods, communities? Are you looking at a statewide policy? You know, what level? So just be aware of that. And on the next slide, 17, there are some definitions in terms of what direct services means, what systems change means. At Konama, we do not fund direct services. We only fund system change efforts. There's also, again, just to reiterate, that there's no standardization in foundation world. We all do things a little bit differently, but basically the process is the same. The application is submitted. There's a initial review, usually by staff, that vet meaning on a bell-shaped curve, there are going to be some proposals or applications that are highly correlated with the funder's mission. Then there's going to be some at the other end that are going to be declined. They either are without, you know, fall without or outside of the priorities, or in our case, they're direct services. And then it's the big group in the middle that staff are going to vet. So some people are declined Others may be invited to do a site visit. Not all foundations do site visits. Then there's a committee review, recommendations, and then ultimately the authorizing body, which is the board, uh, approves the final. Note that on a timeline, this is slide 19, that this also varies, but if you need emergency funding, you're not going to get it through a standard open application process because it generally takes six months. You may apply in June, there's the vetting, there's the site visits, the review process, decline in award letters, and then the grant in our case wouldn't start until January. So there's always going to be that time in between. Some reminders, remember your restrictions. You know, pitch, look at those first terms of what the funder will or will not do. I put Konamas here as an example, but every funder has restrictions. To close, you have to have the right ingredients. It's not just the actual grant writing, but it's all these other tips, strategies that we've discussed. There has to be a good fit between your need and the funder's priorities. We're on slide 21. There has to be, you have to have your own organizational capacity. We look at that. We look at governance. We look at your budget. We look at community involvement, collaboration, et cetera. You have to have a positive approach. If you're all doom and gloom, then you know, and there's nothing that can be done about this huge, overwhelming problem, well, who's going to fund you? You know, the way that you can manage that or approach that is break it down into a manageable piece. So you're not going to solve behavioral health issues in New Mexico. We all know that that is a huge issue right now, but you can do a piece of it. And if you can leverage that piece, you know, and maybe do a part where there's a gap, then you have a, a, a more compelling case, right? And you have to have a good idea, right? You have to have a good idea. And believe me, we're constantly amazed and impressed with the creativity of the people we work with. Constantly, I can honestly say every day, something comes to our attention that we're just like, wow, that's amazing. So it, you, you all, I think, are extremely resourceful and resilient and creative. I put just a few terms here for you. There are lots of glossaries available. I've referenced one here at the Foundation Center, but specific to this presentation, 
I want to just give an example of the difference between a grant and a proposal. You don't write a grant. You write a proposal or you complete a, an application. You don't write a grant. A grant is what you receive. That's an award. You see the difference that the proposal is the application. Now, we further complicate that by saying grant writing. You know, there has to be some thing to complicate it. But, but just so you, that you're clear, you don't write a grant, you write a proposal, and your proposal may or may not be funded. If you're funded, what you receive is a grant award. Fiscal sponsor, many of you use a fiscal sponsor. That is when your organization may be incorporated in New Mexico as a nonprofit, but you don't have your tax exemption from the IRS. So you're not a 501c3. You may be incorporated as a nonprofit and applying for your tax exemption. Or you may be unincorporated in a voluntary group that has no intentions of forming yourself or incorporating, which is fine with us. We don't believe that everyone has to be a nonprofit. As long as you use a fiscal sponsor that is within your mission area, we do pay attention to fiscal sponsorship. So if you're an environmental group and you're using purely an educational fiscal sponsor, we may question that because legally the fiscal sponsor has requirements and it has, they can only fiscally sponsor organizations that are aligned with what they're doing generally. Donor advice funds, these are, bless you, these are funds that are usually through a community foundation where there might be lots of different donors, individual donors like you and I, that have set up a particular fund. They want to fund women and girls or they want to fund, you know, secchias or uh, men and boys. And those are managed by a community foundation. I worked at the Santa Fe Community Foundation for about five years. I think at the time I probably managed two to 300 donor advice funds. So that's different than the general grant cycle that a community foundation does. So when I was there, we had our open grant cycles and then we had the donor advised funds. So they are different. Private foundations like CONAMA, we do not have donor advised funds. Indirect costs is not being used as much as it used to be. Those are costs that cannot be directly traced to a project. So for example, as a nonprofit, you know that you have direct costs for a project, travel, staff, copying, meals for a convening. Your indirect could be something like your organizational audit. So you don't know how much of that to charge to necessarily to particular projects, especially if you do a lot of them. So that's what that means basically. But do look at the um, glossary. I also added some resources, the, both the New Mexico Association of Grant Makers and the Center for Nonprofit Excellence have a grant makers directory and a nonprofit directory. If you have not seen them, please check them out. There are lots of information and my contact information. So at this point, we are going to go to uh, Q&A, and we will see if there are any questions from our, our webinar participants. I think we have about 100 people that are joining us through webinar, as well as folks in this room. If you have a question that is specific to your organization only, then I ask that you hold that question for now. If it's specific to CONAMA, I ask that you contact Denise Gonzalez. If it's a question that may relate to your organization, but could be something that others would also be interested in, then please feel free to, to ask. So we have a question. Does CONAMA have a limit on consecutive years of funding for small grants, Northern New Mexico health grant groups? Although this is specific to CONAMA, I'm going to broaden the response. So again, there is no standardization. All funders are different. However, most funders will not fund in perpetuity. So there are some organizations that CONAMA has funded 
it seems year after year, but they change scope. They're either adding or expanding to what they're doing or what, whatever the case may be, but it's not for the same thing year after year. We do currently have a three-year uh, multi-year grant cycle. We plan to do another one in the future, but that's extremely competitive. And, you know, right now we're only funding four organizations. Um, so, you know, those are, are hard. I'd like to get us to the point where we do two-year grants. We all know there's a limit to what you can do in one year, and there's an incredible amount of time that nonprofits have to spend in fundraising or in resource development. I've been there, I've run many nonprofits, so I do understand that. So, you know, I, I think that we're, that more funders are understanding that and are trying to do more general operating, trying to do multi-year, but it's not, we're not quite there yet. Although that is a recommended best practice, both that funders do more general operating and that funders do more um, multi-year. So um, currently we don't have restrictions in terms, but we will occasionally personally contact an organization and say, you know, we have funded you for four years. We're asking you to sit this one out. So we have done that. And most funders are um, very responsible and will you know, give you some notice, but don't assume that you're going to be funded every year. A question from this group? Yes. That's a, I think one of the way I would do it is I would explain that, just what you said, that, you know, we describe the work that we're doing as this term, which is, you know, consistent with, you know, your term. For purposes of this document, you know, I'm going to use whatever. So I think as long as you make that connection. I have a question coming from... Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback on this. Do I need to lower it or something? Um, it just started now. It just started now. It's probably because I turned this on. Okay. Um, what advice would you give to a small program that is applying for funding and is housed within a much larger organization? For example, a small program within a large university system. Uh, another example that we have a lot of experience with, we handle it a couple of ways. So for example, at UNM, well, let me back up. In general, an organization will not award more than one grant to an organization. Again, I always qualify by saying everyone's different, but generally you can only submit one application by organization unless you're told differently. For CONAMA, you can apply to the small grant and Northern New Mexico. We do allow that. But you cannot apply for a small grant and a multi-year. So every funder is, is different. With um, University of New Mexico or New Mexico State, because they're large institutions, even though we don't fund governmental, they usually have a foundation that meets the requirement for a 501c3. So what we do is we ask them to vet it. Rather than our getting eight or 10 proposals from UNM, we work with the foundation office. They do kind of a, an abbreviated letter of inquiry. So they'll send us first like a case statement, and then we'll say, well, of those eight, we are interested in these three. And then those are the ones that apply. So that's one of the ways we handle it. The other way that we do is if a fiscal sponsor, if a fiscally sponsored organization wants to apply and the fiscal sponsor also wants to apply, we allow both. 
because we're not going to penalize the fiscal sponsor from applying simply because they're serving as a fiscal sponsor for others. So the best way to handle that is to contact the funder directly, usually the program officer or the program director, and they can you know, provide you with, with that specific guidance. Okay, is there another question from this group? Yes. I was wondering, would you guys, or in general, accept a proposal for health and education Okay, the question, yeah, I was just going to do that. The, the question is, would we or would a funder accept a proposal for health and for education wrapped into one? And the answer is certainly, if you put it in that context. Again, in Konama's case, we define health very broadly. So it's behavioral health, environmental health, spiritual health and well-being. It's, you know, from a health equity perspective, which includes education, right? It includes equity, includes everything. So I think it's just a matter, again, of the context, how you're framing it, and if it matches with the funders, funder, funding priorities. And so if you look at our health equity report, you'll see that that, in fact, is included. Okay, is there another online question? So the question is, how often and how do and do funders work together to uh, avoid duplication and overlap? The, the answer is not very well. Uh, funders, uh, we are very good at telling you all what to do, but we're not as good at doing it ourselves. So an example of that is, you know, collaborations. We're always telling nonprofits, don't duplicate, you know, collaborate, coordinate for a collective impact. Um, the, the, the good news is that there is more um, traction in that regard. So for example, many of you have followed that some community foundations, in fact, are working toward doing more together in terms of some of the back office functions, you know, investments and, and so forth. Um, you know, that's, I think, overall a, a positive mood move. We also do well in terms of funders collaboratives. So the Healthy People, Healthy Places initiative that I, I told you about, that was an effort where we all put in money. We have a steering committee that's represented by different groups. Konama has many funders initiatives that we've done. We do not compete with other nonprofits or foundations for funding. We'll only do it if it's through a type of funders collaborative or where the funding is really funder to funder. So we've done Hispanics and Philanthropy. We're doing one right now in terms of Latino men and boys. We've done the Healthy People, Healthy Places, um, et cetera. So I think that we are improving in terms of that. We also have an association that I was a former board member. Denise is a current board member called the New Mexico Association of Grant Makers. So we try to have events where like-minded or funders that are interested in the same area kind of get together so we can see what we're funding. We're, we're doing better at it, but we I think we have a ways to go. Okay, is there another from here? Yes. Okay, a very good question. The question is, would a detox center, for example, be considered a direct service or a systems change? The answer is that everything, even a direct service, can be framed as a systems change. It really has to do with your approach, and, and let me give you an example. 
we funded uh, several years ago La Familia to expand their oral health services, their dental services. Dental oral health clearly is a direct service. What we funded and the reason we funded it is because they, it was a new initiative to try to provide services on a Saturday to an unreached, unserved population of, of children. So we, our funding provided that bridge grant that year, so to speak, that allowed them to set up the program, set up the third party reimbursement system and increase access to an underserved population. So that's the way it was framed. So when you have those kinds of questions, it's best to contact us in the case of Konama to talk with Denise or myself in terms of, of what it is you can do. It's kind of like the, um, the example of, you know, give a fish or teach them to fish, right? It's how that chart in your packet in terms of the different levels. So with the detox center, um, one way to frame that in terms of a systems approach is that you're changing a system of access and that there is a gap in the in this delivery systems in terms of access of care. So what we would be funding would be setting up that system, you know, doing the research that you need, the feasibility, you know, developing the funding, building the community support. That would be a system change. We wouldn't be funding directly the services that are being provided. Does that help? Okay. Okay, is there another one on the line? The question is, is there any advice in terms of uh, nonprofits, grant seekers seeking international funding? Many community foundations, because of donor advice funds, can fund outside of the geographic area. So Santa Fe Community Foundation, for example, although their primary area is Santa Fe, kind of northern New Mexico, have a lot of donors that fund internationally. So community foundations are one source. There are also um, organizations that include international grant making as part of their portfolio. So you can do some research. The New Mexico Grant Makers Directory is a searchable database. That's one place to look. The Foundation Center, you know, just Google search, right, in terms of international funding. Um, also groups that do international work, you might want to check in, into that, but it's going to require some, some research. But you don't have to look outside of New Mexico. You can start uh, by with your local community foundation. Question in person? Yes. The, the question relates to an organization that generally applies for 100%, usually to fund a new position, with the um, understanding that if it's successful and the organization supports it, that the board then may approve some funding for it in the, in the next or subsequent years. The response to that is a, a couple of things. Uh, for one, a lot of times when you're writing the proposal, it gets down to what's compelling. Remember I talked about the bell-shaped curve that some really excel, some are automatically declined, most fall in the middle. So if you're applying for funding to support a new position, that's going to be tricky. It's not as compelling, for example, when you have all these other competing proposals to fund a position when we all know in the field that 80% of our costs are people, right? We are a people-driven field. But there are ways for you to do that where you're not saying, I want 15,000 so we can hire someone on a part-time basis. And one of the ways that you can do that is frame it within your mission. And you know, so use that rather than say, it's gonna go to hire a new position. 
funders, in my opinion, similar to the medical profession, have the responsibility to do no harm. So that means we should not be funding programs that cannot continue. I live in Española. Oftentimes, organizations in Santa Fe, when they get funding, will expand to Española. But then when the funding gets tight, the first thing is cut is the Española satellite. Sick and tired of that. So funders, again, have a responsibility not to do that. So there has to be the commitment, there has to be a track record, there has to be some type of sustainability if it's for ongoing. So in your case, you could use that. You could use that this is the way your organization does it, you know, that, you know, that, that the different programs are responsible for finding the funding, but then, you know, there is an organizational commitment in terms of, you know, sustainability. That would work, but the way you would frame the proposal is I wouldn't ask for the funding just to fund a position. I would turn it around and I would speak to the need about what you're gonna do. So fund position versus we are going to expand our services to include outreach to uninsured, underinsured population. You see the difference? In your budget, you're still gonna show X amount is gonna go to a position, but that's not what you're asking for, okay? Question online. Um, do you think the odds are increased in a positive way when there is local community collaboration? Do we think the odds are increased when there is local collaboration? The answer is absolutely. We absolutely um, limit. There are limited resources. So one of the things that any grant review committee is going to look at is are you duplicating are you collaborating are you leveraging that is critical not just in terms of limited resources but in terms of impact on a community so if we meet with folks and again denise and i for example meet with people year round and they're talking about rural services we're going to say have you, are you partnering with the National Center for Frontier Communities? Are you, you know, working with this other group that focuses on rural? And if they don't even know about the groups, that clearly raises a, a red flag. So that's why it would be good for you to look at resources such as the nonprofit directory and other directories to find out who is doing the work, how can what you're doing enhance supplement or fill a gap in terms of that. It's it's critical. In person? Okay, you and then you. Right. I'm I'm still not clear on the question in terms of the fiscal sponsorship piece. So if you have an organization and you are fiscal sponsored for other programs and projects, then basically you have one board, you have one organization where there are sort of ideas and projects and programs being pulled under one five oh one C three. That that to me seems like one way of collaborating and partnering and sharing resources. The other is having various organizations come together. The, the question is, if you're a fiscal sponsor and you're working with a number of fiscally sponsored projects, is there an advantage to that approach versus the respective individual fiscally sponsored nonprofits or organizations working together? And I guess the, the answer to that would be both. It really varies. So in that case, 
Um, I would be particularly interested in terms of a fiscal sponsor taking the initiative to build capacity for the organizations that they're fiscally sponsoring. I think there's not very much of that going on. There's a big need, particularly in New Mexico, that would be a unique proposal, very interested in that. At the same time, that doesn't stop you and the respective organizations that you're sponsoring. They are independent. That's one of the characteristics of a nonprofit sector is regardless of whether you are incorporated, have your tax exemption or not, they're independent. So you can't control them as a fiscal sponsor, but you can certainly provide resources on a voluntary basis. So, so they should be doing that anyway in terms of their own organizations, again, trying to complement, coordinate, leverage, collective impact, all that kind of good stuff. But it, it, so it really kind of varies depending on the fiscal sponsor and it varies depending on the organizations that you're sponsoring. And that's why we allow applications from both, from all, because they are independent. Does that answer your, your question? But be happy to talk to you more about that. Okay, online question. Okay. Any other? No, I'm sorry. You had a question. Um, my question goes back to what you were saying about the relationship with the foundations, um, because it seems to me there's foundations providing investment, but also because of the role in the communities, there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge there, because they work with so many different um, programs, they kind of have the oversight um, capability, and more specifically, like with our organization. <laughs> We're also talking about integrity, and all of us are always assessing where our weaknesses are in areas where we can kind of identify ways we can better meet our mission. And for us, it's working with Rio Viva more in a deeper way. Like 50% of the clients we serve are there, and I'm involved in a lot of initiatives and lots of partnerships. But I also feel as if we need to develop deeper relationships with community leaders. And I feel as if the foundations would have that knowledge because they're the ones sponsoring that. So how do the nonprofits kind of access and create a relationship with foundations where they can talk about identified weaknesses and use that knowledge and that expertise um, to, to address them? Does that make sense? Yeah, so the question, and correct me if I don't have it all, is how do nonprofits take advantage of the kind of information and experience that foundations or funders have in, in uh, funding respective geographic areas. Again, uh, no standardization. Every funder is different. The way that Conalma does it is we generally do it through convenings. So for example, just within the last couple of months, we've done a number of statewide convenings. We did one on workforce development. Uh, particularly for frontline workers because we're trying to, you know, provide uh, more resources in that regard. We did one on a current project that we're working on with, in partnership with the Kellogg Foundation, on assessing the impact of the Affordable Care Act in New Mexico from a health equity perspective. What's working? What's not working? Where are the gaps? What policy recommendations? <laughs> We did another one on our Healthy People, Healthy Places, where we're trying to advance health equity to communities through food policy, built environment. Built environment is where anything that's people made, uh, sidewalks, playgrounds, anything that's people made, lighting, et cetera. So in all of those cases, we invite all stakeholders. We invite funders, we invite policymakers, we invite nonprofits. So we always do that. A lot of funders have different opportunities for convening. McCune, uh, recently, I think they have this uh, web-based chat kind of thing that they're doing, which is another attempt for people to provide input. Um, the New Mexico Association of Grant Makers, for three years in a row, we had a joint grant maker, grant seeker conference. This year, it'll be a little bit different for a variety of reasons, but next year, it'll go back and I think they're looking at doing it maybe every other year, a joint conference of nonprofits and of funders. Those are, are those kinds of events are non 
soliciting. So that means you can't go as a nonprofit and say, uh, funder, let me tell you about my program. But you can go and meet with folks that have a similar interest. And that's where funders learn about what's going on. That's what you learn when you learn about what people are doing. So it's a great opportunity. So my suggestion is look for the, those opportunities. There's also funders fairs that we participate in. We have partnered with the Northern New Mexico Health Grant Groups to do funder fairs. We have um, we participate in the one that the Association for uh, fundraising professionals do in Albuquerque every year. So take advantage of those kinds of opportunities as well. The other way, uh, going back to the beginning, is look at their websites. Look at who they're funding. You know, look at what their program initiative interests are. If they release a new strategic plan, funders are always changing their fund their, their priorities. You've got to stay on top of that. Okay. We have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, what elements go into a one-page case statement for support? The question is, what elements go into a one-page case statement for support? The, the response is that it's good for you to have lots of case statements so that it's kind of like a menu. So depending, you know, all of you do lots of things, right? Some might be your own capacity building. It might be developing your board. It may be developing your resource development plan. It may be, a, you know, expanding your web or social media. It could be, you know, outreach. So you all have different needs. So it's good for you to kind of write up case statements. Uh, which is just really kind of a concept. So what you want to include in a case statement, depending on who it is for, number one, follow directions. If they are saying, give us a case statement or give us a concept, then it has to be what I call standalone, meaning that everything has to be in that page. Who you are, who your contact information is, what your mission is, what you know, you're trying to, uh, what population you serve, what's your geographic area. It goes back to the who, what, when, where, why, and how much is, is basically it. It's concise. You need to go back through it several times, make sure you're clear, you define your terms, no jargon. And that what I do is I give it to someone who's not in my field, and I'll say, what does that mean? Say, well, I'm not clear what this is, or I think it means you're doing this. It's like, yeah, that's it. So I always test it. I think that's always a good uh, strategy is to have someone who's not in your field, you know, take a look at it. Because we are so, we're very much into our own heads, right? And so we just assume people know what we're talking about. Often they don't. So it's best to give it to someone who's not, you know, could be an office worker, could be a volunteer, could be your spouse. You know, give it to someone else because that often um, will, will give you a lot of feedback. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm Sanders Board Director of Environment, Investment, Research, and Policy Center. And I have just two quick questions. One is um, you mentioned these joint I wanted to know how we could find out about those. And then my second is earlier you mentioned that you think that the funding is going to get worse before it gets better. It seems like it's gotten a little bit better over time, so I'm just curious about why you think that. So okay. I'll be prepared. Okay, two, two questions. What, the first one is how do people find out about the joint conference? So there's a couple of ways. One is um, if there's one, again, I'm not I don't, I'm not on the board of grant makers anymore, but my understanding is that they're going to do one next year. Uh, and Konoma has always funded those, has always been a primary sponsor, because that's one of our priorities is to support nonprofits and community. So there's a couple of ways you do it. If there is one, you can join our um, email list. You simply go to Konoma, I think, and sign up, and we'll put you on our list when we have announcements. You can, um, and then, so we would send that out, for example, to anyone on our list. You know, we would send whatever information they send to us, we would send it out. So that's one way. Um, and then the New Mexico Association of Grant Makers, they send out the information, and then they ask us in turn, we're a member, to then distribute it, you know, to our, our, our membership. So that's a, a simple way to do it. In terms of the second question, it is that I had stated that I thought things were going to get 
worse before they got better. I wasn't speaking to funding specifically, um, although it includes funding. What I mean by that in terms, again, my experience with the nonprofit sector and also my study of it, my, my doctoral studies are nonprofit management and philanthropy. So it's not just my experience, but you know, the academic side is that the sector, there's always been kind of this uh, peaks and valley where, you know, sometimes the, the sector gets like um, a lot of attention, a lot of resources. That's not just grant making, but other like there have been times where there's been a lot of money available for technical assistance and then it all disappears and there's no technical assistance. There's been some times where there's more multi-year funding and then nobody has funds. Or there's been periods like now where funders are changing their priorities. Many people in New Mexico have changed their priorities within the last two years. Or there may be executive transitions where the heads of foundations like Atlantic Philanthropies, Kellogg, et cetera, McCune, Santa Fe Community Foundation, New Mexico Community Foundation, where the head people change, the CEOs or the executive directors, have a lot of influence. And so when that happens, invariably, there's a review and a reframing of priorities. So when I'm talking about that I think things are going to get worse in the sector before they get better, it's referring to all of the above, where there are many changes going on, including demographic shifts. So for example, in New Mexico, the aging population right now, it's going to go from New Mexico being ranked 39th in the nation to fourth within the next 15 years in the percentage of people 65 and older. We know that's a demographic shift. Funders may not be interested in aging. They're interested in youth and children. So the funding doesn't always follow the needs of a community. So for example, aging is one of our areas of interest. We get very few proposals. Or the issue of grandparents raising grandchildren is another one. The other big demographic shift, and this is one way, by the way, as a, a funding strategy, stay ahead of those curves. Know what the trends are, stay ahead of them to the degree that it relates to your work. Don't get into the mission drift, but to the degree that it relates to your work, pay attention to those because you'll be ahead of the curve. Um, so those are some examples. Another big demographic shift is the shift um, in terms of diversity. New Mexico is already a majority minority state. The rest of the country is going to follow. So we're actually, again, ahead of the curve. So when I talk with national foundations and I write proposals, I include that. It said New Mexico's already there. We're a microcosm. We're ahead of the curve. We have things to teach the rest of the country in terms of diversity. So though it's all of those things all together is what I'm referring to, is that all of those elements impact nonprofits on so many levels. There's also the issue of executive transition. You know, there are people like myself, baby boomers, went into social work, went into nonprofits because of, you know, we're hippies, right? Um, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. Now there's fewer and fewer people that are going into managing nonprofits. It's a tough job, hard job. And they, you know, so we're having this, this a little bit of a problem in terms of getting enough people that are willing to kind of follow in our, our footsteps. So I could go on and on if you're real interested in that, but there are many, many uh, factors that are impacting our sector. We have one uh, online. And then we'll continue. Um, it's kind of specific to Konama, but I think it could be generalized. Okay. If a nonprofit completes this proposal in sufficient time to allow someone from your staff to review the proposal for its viability and point out weaknesses, will they do so in order for the weaknesses to be addressed before the final proposal is submitted? So the question is, if someone completes a proposal and submits it in advance of the deadline, will Con Alma review it, critique it, and give feedback? The answer is it depends. The best way to do that is during the year, not two weeks before the proposal is due, because we just don't have time. I mean, we're just pressed for time. Um, but during the year, if you have a concept and you just want to send a concept, then Denise and I 
are happy to do that. Um, we don't make decisions on the grant, and so, and it is our job to match resources. So we have don't have a problem with that. But if you're, you know, too close, we just don't have time. It's just not possible because there's so many questions. Like now, for example, our deadline is what in two weeks. Uh, you know, there's so many questions that we're just trying to handle day to day, right? So it, it really kind of depends on the timing. It also depends on the funder. Some funders will not do that, ever. Some will do it after the fact, you know, when people call and say, how come I wasn't funded? I met the funding guidelines. I got it in on time. Well, sometimes the answer really is availability of funding. If we get 100 proposals, we can only fund 10 or 12. And if the 100 proposals represent 2 million in requests, and we only have 125,000 or 150 to fund, then the majority of the proposals are going to be fund worthy, meet our requirements. We simply cannot do it. So then it's going to go down to compelling, right, um, and other, other lenses. So it, it really just kind of depends in terms of, you know, when you do it and, you know, um, and this respective funder. Some funders will give you more specific information. As a private foundation, we do not have to. We will. If we have anything concrete, we will share it with you. But sometimes the answer may truly be that, you know, we, we, we would have funded it if we would have had more funds. Uh, some, some funders, again, will share that. If you're governmental, they will share it because there's a rating and they will because it's our tax dollars, right? It's public. So if you do governmental, that's one of the differences is that they can say, on this section, the max was 20 points, you got five. But that's governmental. That's not, um, you know, foundations. Okay. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, when we send in a proposal, let's just say $30,000, and you look at our audit or, you know, our budget, you know, like, you really don't need $30,000. Do you guys take it upon yourself? We'll offer you the grant, but we will only give you this much. Can you okay. Do that? The, the question is, if you say an organization's limit is 30000 you apply for 30000 but the funder may say, you know, we don't think you need $30,000, we'll offer you fifteen. dollars Okay, again, that varies by funder. In, in my experience, um, if a grant-making committee says, oh, let's cut them all by 10%, you know, we want to fund... 14 instead of 12, so let's cut them all. I will say, no, we can't do that. We have to look at them individually because some may truly need 10,000. Some have capacity and they could probably do eight. And so it's really up to us to kind of make that judgment. Okay? It depends. It, 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 everything depends because there's a lot of factors. But we don't automatically cut. Uh, we do look at other factors. And on the other hand, if someone is ranked like the highest and, you know, they really could do with less, but we may just give them the whole amount because it was so compelling and we support it. So there's a lot of judgment. Now, I'm going to have to just allow one more question, so or, or maybe I can get back to yours after. We are at 1127. We will end at 1130. But again, those of you that are here, I'm happy to continue and answer your questions offline. Those of you that are online, feel free to send me questions if they're general or Denise, if they're specific to CONAMA. So I'm going to see if there's another online be before. OK, then I will. Yours will be the last. I guess mine will be simple. When we write a proposal and we need statistics with therapists, because we have a lot of therapists at UNM that have master's degree that actually work with the actual people, can we use their statements, their statistics of their people that they work with? And of course, no names or anything, but of how many that have succeeded in the programs that they provide? There'd be no reason not to, but again, it would have to be framed in terms of the funder's interest because, again, you have limited space, right? So you have to make it you have to make it count. So you're not going to throw in statistics that aren't really relevant to what you're asking for or the or the funder's interest. Okay. 
So in, um, in closing, let me just say again that it is funders' responsibility to match resources with needs. So they're not doing you a favor. It's, their, it's our job, right? It's your responsibility, you know, to do your homework, to, you know, match your funding needs with your mission. Don't just follow the money. Develop relationships. Keep integrity. Um, and I, I think that hopefully some of these, you know, tips and strategies can help increase your um, success in terms of funding and, and resourcing the organizations. Also keep in mind that grant writing is just one aspect. There are many other types of resource development in terms of partnering and leveraging and volunteering and technical assistance. So this is simply one side. And I think the last thing I would say on this in, in closing is that don't forget that your job does not end once you're funded. You have to pay attention in terms of can you reapply, when are the reports due. That's a critical piece, and it's often forgotten, and it gets lost, where even a simple spreadsheet, I got this proposal, the report is due here, the final report is due here, eligible to reapply, maybe, or yes or no. You know, one-year funding, two-year funding, the amount, you know, keep that information because that's where nonprofits um, – I think fall down is that they forget once they get the grant that you're still responsible. It doesn't end there. Thank you all very much.